meeting, the annual meeting for the North, uh, for this morning, Friday, October the 21st. Um, I want to welcome everyone here this morning. Um, and uh, first order of business, I want to acknowledge the recent correspondence from the State Ethics Commission and Conflicts Advisory. There is a list that was attached to the agenda of individuals who uh, have uh, been approved through the uh, State Ethics Commission. Um, and we would ask the Secretary to go ahead and record that for the minutes um, as required. Thank you. I want to remind members of the council are hereby advised of their duty under the State Government Ethics Act to avoid conflicts of interest and the appearance of conflict and are instructed to refrain from participating in any matter coming before this council with respect to which there is a conflict of interest or an appearance of conflict. So as we move forward, if you have any issues that come up that need to be addressed and put in the minutes, please let us know. Recognize. Vice President Todd Brown for an invocation, please. Let us pray. We come this morning giving praise for this week's many blessings of great fellowship and, com and camaraderie that we have enjoyed, as well as bittersweet moments inherent in, inherent in October leadership and council changes that we have experienced, all in furtherance of executing the state bar's mission of protecting the public. We look forward this morning to receiving remarks from on the state of our judiciary and reports from other bar leadership to inform our deliberations. We pray your blessings and guidance as we address matters coming before us, that you grant us the wisdom, judgment, respect, and patience to complete our work this morning in a manner pleasing in your sight, and that you empower us to resolve to continue to be good stewards of the State Bar's mission once we depart. We ask these blessings and others that we deserve. Let us all say amen. 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 Thank you, Todd. So, uh, at this point in time, recognize, recognize special guests that are with us. Of course, uh, this morning we have Chief Justice Paul Newby with us. Good morning, sir. Good morning. And I believe that uh, his Chief of Staff Liz Henderson is also. Liz, there you go. Thank you all for coming this morning, and we look forward to hearing from the Chief Justice in a few minutes. Also in attendance, we have uh, Shelby Benton, who is going to be giving a uh, report a little bit later, uh, along with Lee Bayless from the Board of Law Examiners. Good morning, Lee. Um, and at this point in time, we have one of our recipients of the Student Pro Bono Service Award, Kaylee Morgan. Kaylee, raise your hand. There you are. And with Kaylee today is her mom, her grandfather, and her aunt. We want to welcome you guys to uh, the State Board Council. So, welcome. <clears throat> We uh, always are privileged and uh, appreciate Chief Justice uh, Paul Newby for coming before us and giving us the state of the judiciary. And we uh, are grateful for the uh, relationship that we've built with him over the number of years. And I would call upon Chief Justice. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, frequency occurrence to fundamental principles, absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty. Uh, some mornings, it's why me? But most mornings, maybe it's a good thing to say, why me? Why, what has given me the privilege I have uh, to be a lawyer, uh, to be recognized uh, by peers, by people, to be selected for the position? I know there's most states, I'm like, wow, there's no way I can, I can do what the people have entrusted me to do. And perhaps you feel that way as a state bar counselor, uh, chosen by your peers to represent all lawyers in the district from which uh, you've been chosen. Uh, what, what an incredible honor that is, uh, to be recognized that you are the person 
uh, in whom they have trust uh, to help us with our self-regulated um, profession. Uh, so uh, I, I just, I know for me, uh, every morning I think it's important for me to be sure uh, that I recognize the uh, honor and responsibility and uh, certainly to humbly seek to do what is right and just and fair in every situation, as I know you do as well. Uh, I continue to encourage you as you have ideas about how we can make things better. Please pass them along. Don't keep them to yourself. Um, you know, that's my goal. I know that's your goal as well as you uh, take on and you uh, act on the responsibility that you have with regard to uh, the state bar. Um, just like you have transitions, I noticed uh, several of your uh, counselors uh, that are rotating off. Uh, we're losing about two dozen judges, uh, December 31. Uh, most of those have to do with our statutory senility uh, that <laughs> is currently in effect. Uh, you know, perhaps it's time for us to reevaluate if 72 is the right uh, retirement age. I, I know uh, as the Chief Justice and kind of having the overview of our uh, judicial branch, uh, it uh, pains me to see uh, these uh, judges uh, having to retire. Now, the good news is I can use my authority, should they desire, to come back as emergency recall and, uh, to uh, allow them to continue to use the incredible skill sets that they've developed and the wisdom uh, that experience brings. Uh, but uh, perhaps it, it's time for us to look at uh, the retirement age. Um, E-courts. Sorry, e-headache. Um, uh, it's gonna, we're gonna get there. Uh, let me tell you the, the, the good news. And I'm so proud of the folks at the Administrative Office of the Courts. Uh, when we first came into office on January 1 of 2021, my task for the Administrative Office of the Courts was, y'all need to tell me if Tyler Technology, this Fortune 500 company, is the biggest uh, provider of court um, electronic filing services in the nation, if they have the bandwidth to do what we're asking them to do. And they did a deep dive because uh, we didn't negotiate the contract, we didn't uh, choose the vendor, but we owned it. I mean, I'm not backing away from that. I'm, I'm an e dinosaur whose legacy will be e courts. <laughs> All right. But, um, I'm, I'm so proud of them because um, uh, Wake County, which has been great, Harnett, Lee, Johnston, our pilot counties are just doing exactly what we've uh, asked them to do, which is to give us the hard feedback. And we had October 10th, a year and a half after Tyler had promised that this product would be ready. Uh, but as we have said, uh, we're not going to have e guinea pigs. We're not going to just roll something out before it's ready for prime time. And so uh, every, uh, our internal folks and Tyler felt like they could get whatever bugs were there worked out by October the 10th. Uh, we had a meeting with the stakeholders. Uh, we showed what workarounds were going to be necessary. Let me put it in perspective. Our current system we've had for about 25 years, and every week we are tweaking aspects of the current system to meet whatever current issue may be, uh, may have arisen. So. You know, it's, it's not, okay, it's done, we never have to look at it again kind of thing. It will be ongoing tweaks, but there are certain vital uh, uh, aspects that have to be performed. And while there may be workarounds, at some point, uh, the labor becomes too intensive and uh, it needs to be fixed on a, uh, a, a system-wide basis. So uh, we made the decision not to roll it out. Uh, based on feedback from our pilot districts. Uh, and uh, I wish I could uh, tell you that we have a date certain. Uh, uh, we kind of do, but uh, again, uh, we have a punch list that we have given to Tyler and said, you have got to fix these things before we roll out the pilot. And if they get it done by a date that we have selected that gives us the proper amount of runway to present it to our pilot districts, uh, then it could be uh, December. 
But if they don't, uh, we're not going to roll it out. Uh, we got one shot at a good first impression, and uh, we just don't want to uh, spoil that opportunity. So, uh, you know, I think that's good news that our folks are taking uh, what I think is the high ground, and we're just not going to roll it out until it's ready. Uh, so, uh, that's that's our update there. Uh, 100 counties. Uh, my wife, Megan, and I have visited all 100 counties. Uh, we are diverse in every way you can define diversity. I met my first late ocean judge, Judge Laos, and uh, I said, uh, how did you get here to Albemarle, North Carolina, Stanley County? Uh, and he said, well, my dad worked for the CIA in Laos, and we had to be relocated. I said, but why Albemarle in Stanley County? He said, well, they want to make sure nobody could ever find us. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Um, diverse in every way you want to define diversity, uh, our court system is. Um, you know, in North Carolina, geographically, we have the highest point, which Mount Mitchell, uh, and uh, we have, you know, a, a below point. And I, I, you know, I was like, well, do we have really, really low spots in North Carolina? I didn't know that. So what do you do when you don't know something? You ask Siri, right? So I asked Siri, what's the lowest spot in North Carolina? And literally, it came back, duh, it's where the ocean meets the sand. Like, oh, okay, yeah, sea level. Okay, I got that. So, you know, we're diverse geographically, we're diverse uh, uh, socioeconomic, you know, you name diversity, we have it. Well, let me tell you what unites us as a, uh, as a judicial system, as a legal system. Uh, every county we went to, uh, we were so impressed with the dedication of the deputy and assistant clerks, the magistrates, the bailiffs, the court reporters, court administrators, uh, the custodians. They all take such pride in their work. They understand that they are the ones who assist and equip the judges to do justice without favor, denial, or delay. They understand how important their positions are. Uh, they understand that public trust and confidence is only as good as the last interaction that they had with the folks that came into their courthouse. They understand how important it is that we treat everybody with dignity and respect. So I am so encouraged uh, from our, uh, uh, all the folks who are part of our judicial family with regard to their commitment uh, to uh, helping our judicial system uh, meet our constitutional demands. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, I could not uh, be uh, more pleased than what we found as we have been to all 100 counties. Uh, and we found out that what works in Wake County doesn't work in Pike County, doesn't work in Chowan, doesn't work in Mecklenburg. To my friends from Mecklenburg, does anything work? No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to say that. Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, uh, we are diverse in every way that you can define it. Uh, but uh, in, a, in a really strong way, I think. Um, so I'm so grateful. Uh, through our Chief Justice Commission on Professionalism, we have uh, begun to recognize the unsung heroes of the courthouse by uh, having a Magistrate of the Year, a uh, Deputy Clerk of the Year, a Bailiff of the Year, a Guardian Ad Litem of the Year. They get nominated and, you know, it, it's, we can just barely scratch the surface. I mean, there's so many qualified folks, but uh, time and again, these people who are laboring day in and day out are just in tears when they are recognized in front of their peers for their hard work and dedication. Uh, and so I've, I've been gratified uh, to see that. Uh, let me thank you and please pass this word along to your uh, fellow attorneys. Uh, we have done an amazing job with the COVID backlog. We are now better than we were pre-COVID with regard to the backlog of our cases. Uh, everyone has uh, dug in and started uh, you know, uh, for revamping all the, the different uh, trial levels of the courthouses, and uh, we are making significant progress. I mean, justice delayed is justice denied, and I'm so proud of our attorneys, uh, our DAs and defense bar, and our 
civil uh, cases, you know, we're, we're continuing to look at ways that we can enhance and improve the system. But uh, please pass along uh, to the attorneys in your district how proud I am of them for getting in, trying these cases, uh, bringing uh, justice uh, in those matters. Uh, and the last thing I'll just mention a little bit is professionalism. Um, there's a banner that our Chief Justice Commission on Professionalism has placed in every courthouse asking the simple question, which I think is uh, kind of the essence of our code of professional responsibility. You know? and that's, are you treating others the way you want to be treated? Uh, there's a, a banner that we put in every courthouse. And again, every place we went, uh, that continues to be a challenge and particularly with the younger lawyers, uh, the younger generation, with regard to their treatment of each other and the treatment of the judges, uh, the process, uh, we need to come up with some ways uh, to address uh, the challenges of professionalism. So as you have opportunities um, to uh, observe that, and if you have some ideas, please, uh, please let us know. Uh, I'm so uh, excited to partner with your leadership about the whole idea of uh, legal deserts, that's another thing, a continuing thing that we heard when we went to the rural counties that, you know, well, we used to have a dozen attorneys and now we're down to six and, you know, half of those are fixing to retire. Um, uh, time and again, we were hearing that. And while the uh, attorney uh, essential needs, it seems like, are being met by attorneys out of some of the bigger metropolitan areas that are uh, covering other parts of the state, uh, I personally believe that every community is uh, improved by having attorneys there. I believe that attorneys are just part of the fabric of the community. Certainly uh, the opportunity to uh, influence, to be counselors, uh, is uh, so much of what is uh, prevalent in these smaller rural counties. And uh, we have to come up with some way to uh, encourage particularly folks uh, that are currently in law school to think outside the, well, we want to go to Raleigh, Charlotte, Greensboro, or Winston, uh, maybe Wilmington and Asheville. You know, we just need to be sure that uh, we have the uh, attorneys in, frankly, all of our counties. So uh, as uh, your leadership is um, uh, coming up with ways to try to enhance that, uh, I certainly am looking forward to working with them. But again, thank you for the privilege I have of kind of giving you uh, uh, an update. This is uh, a meeting that I look forward to every quarter just to let y'all know, at least from my perspective, how things are going. And I so thank you, each of you, for what you do uh, to ensure that uh, we are administering equal justice for everybody. Thank you. Uh, representatives of the North Carolina Bar Association that are with us today. We have Clayton Morgan. We also have Jason Henson, Executive Director. And Clayton, if you come up and give us a report. <coughs> thank you so much for having us here today. And thank you for allowing us to participate in last night's event. And congratulations. Uh, a few things from the North Carolina Bar Association and Bar Foundation that uh, to be of interest in this body today. Start with the association. Uh, our partnership continues with the PBS of North Carolina, formerly UNCTV. On September 21st, uh, representatives from the Bar Association met at the PBS studios and, and, and hosted the appellate judicial candidate forum. That's where the candidates were running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals and North Carolina Supreme Court came together with a moderator from PBS of North Carolina to take the forms. It was very well done, and uh, if you have not seen them, you can access the link <clears throat> on our website, um, just keywords, judicial, appellate judicial candidate form, because those were some uh, great interactions between the candidates and the moderator was one. Uh, second thing with the association, concerns of CLEs, uh, with very few exceptions, we still continue to have hybrid options. Uh, we offer uh, our attendees the option of coming to the bar center in person or Zoom. And by and large, people are still opting for the Zoom options. But we're not giving up on that because we're making a value proposition every day. We're in person 
uh, the benefits of in-person fellowship at these CLEs, because as we all know in this room, that's where we, we get the biggest bang for our buck. And professionalism starts to abound. Um, foundation. So two things on the foundation. Uh, the first is, at last uh, last Friday, we had our board of directors a meeting in Charlotte, and the board approved a, um, a DE&I fellowship um, uh, program. Recall, uh, Past President Howe partly let you know that back in January, the board of directors had approved a DEI restricted endowment fund. We had to work over the last eight or nine months to put a program in place that, that, that corresponded in parallel with that, with that endowment fund. We call it an open door fellowship uh, because it, it advances the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion for the Bar Foundation. Basically, it's, a, it's two 1L fellowships that will be targeted to historically underrepresented and under-resourced students from North Carolina Law Schools. We're going to have them partner with um, the Minorities and Professional Committee members, the Women and Professional Committee members, the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity uh, Committee members, and our YLD Committee members, to give them an experience that will help them open a network. Not all law students come to law school in the same uh, platform. People need, some students need access, and they, they need it sooner rather than later, so they don't have to figure it out in three years. So this, this, these fellowships will help them do that. Give them exposure, give them exposure to our annual meeting, what we do and why we do it, the governance behind the, the, the scenes. So uh, stay tuned for that. The, the development committee is also working very hard to get the endowment off the ground. And once the endowment is fully funded in the future years, it's gonna support the Open, open Door Fellowship, and, and others as well that all pay for DEI. The last thing for the foundation, um, it concerns uh, an event we had just two, two nights ago at the Bar Center. The first in three years, it was the dedication of three, of four justice funds, uh, an anonymous justice fund and three named justice funds. Uh, these names that we're about to read off to you should be well known in our legal community. Joseph uh, Cheshaw V, he had a justice fund dedicated to his honor. Uh, George Mass. He had a justice fund dedicated to his honor. And the late Rudy Ogburn as well. And Rudy also had a bench uh, dedicated to his honor and a liberty party. So um, for those of you who don't know, these justice funds go towards supporting uh, legal services organizations like Legal Aid in North Carolina, uh, Pistol Legal Services, and Charlotte Center for Legal Advocacy and others. So it's very important that we continue to have these types of justice funds to come to fruition with the Bar Foundation. We're looking forward to many more. Uh, so it's very well attended, law firm, uh, partners came out, family, friends, um, a great evening, it, it was all in person. Uh, so that's the update, the Bar Association Foundation. Thank you for your time. <laughs> At each uh, annual meeting, we uh, recognize the Student Pro Bono Service Awards. Um, we have that opportunity to do that this morning. I don't know if all of them are here, but I do know that there is one individual here, and I want to call her forward. It's Kaylee Morgan. Come on up. As Kaylee comes up, Kaylee is a, a student at Duke University School of Law. She began her student service the summer before law school started with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Once in law school, she immediately joined the Duke Law Innocence Project, project. hoping to, to also serve her hometown of Durham. She set up her own independent pro bono projects with the Center of Death Penalty Litigation and with Forward Justice. She completed over 70 hours of pro bono service during her first semester of law school. And during her time at Duke Law, she provided over 1,000 hours of pro bono legal assistance. Her supervisors commend not only the quantity, but the quality of her work. So I want to congratulate Kaylee Morgan. Individuals are here. If you'll come up, I'm, I'm going to present you the award. 
Uh, other individuals from the other law schools include <coughs> Cyril Reiner, Jillian, and she's from North Carolina Central School of Law, Jillian Barry Camp from Campbell University School of Law, Julia Leopold from the University of North Carolina, Allison Thomas from Elon School of Law, and Olivia Osborne. Julie. Julie Leopold uh, is a student at the University of North Carolina School of Law. She served as the director of the University of North Carolina Pro Bono program during her third year. She held the program as a facilitator and as a participant, creating opportunities for her classmates and often volunteering to serve alongside them. She encouraged students to focus on the why behind pro bono projects, and she was instrumental in helping her graduating class have a 100 participation rate for pro bono work. I would like to present Julie. Julian Camp. She is uh, at my alma mater, Campbell Law School. Julian served as the managing director of the Campbell Law Pro Bono Council during the 2021-2022 academic year. She managed 14 various student-led pro bono projects and diligently worked to develop and implement opportunities for Campbell Law students to serve the community by practicing and a pro bono service project. After pondering a question from her first day of law school orientation, why did you come to law school for her first year? She came to realize that serving others gave her the why. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm not. I'm guessing that Cheryl Reiner is not here. <clears throat> Each October, we have an opportunity, or the unfortunate opportunity, to say goodbye to counselors who have served on this council, and I believe that all of our retiring counselors this year have served their full nine-year terms. Um, and I just want to recognize them this morning. I know we recognized them on Wednesday night, but if you would stand up um, as I call your name, I would appreciate it. Uh, Everett Thompson is from District 1. He served from 2013 to 2022. Thank you, Everett. Heidi Bloom, is she here? I don't see her. Okay, Heidi is uh, is our representative from District 10, or one of our many representatives from District 10. She served from 2014 to 2022. Charles Davis. Charles. <laughs> Charles is from District 17. Thank you, Charles. Matt McCarley. State of Mecklenburg. Well, congratulations, Matt. John Willardson. That's uh, John Roger Federer Willardson <laughs> from District 34, which is up in Wilkes County. And then our own Matthew Smith, who is our new vice president. We have um, a number of reports that are included in your materials this morning. The Board of Law Examiners, the Disciplinary Hearing Commission, 
the Board of Continuing Legal Education, the Board of Legal Specialization, the Board of Paralegal Certification, the Client Security Fund Board of Trustees, the Alter <coughs> Board of Trustees, and the Lawyers Assistance Program Board. We're going to take oral reports this morning from the IOLTA um, board and to give the IOLTA annual report is Shelby Benton. Shelby, come on up. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, allowing me to be here. And last night and yesterday afternoon, just a wonderful, uh, wonderful day for um, the state bar and um, makes us all proud uh, to be lawyers. Uh, I am here to give you the IELTA report today, um, and I'm, I'm really happy that to do that. Uh, Mary Irvine is our executive director, but a week or so ago, she gave birth to her second child. And uh, they're all doing well, but she asked if I would come in and uh, make the report for us. Uh, we are the philanthropic arm of the State Bar, and we're proud to provide access to justice and partnership with every lawyer across the state of North Carolina by funding high-quality legal services through civil legal aid. Uh, we're working to create a North Carolina where all individuals and families and children can fairly navigate the justice system and have their basic needs and rights protected. We um, do this by using the funds generated from lawyers, interest on lawyers' trust account to support legal aid and the administration of justice programs across our state. So for our 2021 annual report, so that's what you're getting, 2021, there's a written report in your um, portal, so I hope you'll look at it. But to give you some highlights about 2021. Um, as the pandemic wore on, we uh, continued to work as a leader, partner, and funder uh, to seek and support and improve the access to legal services. One of the biggest tasks that we took on in 2021, we've talked to you about before, and that was to develop a strategic plan. The board and the staff worked jointly together in that effort, and our goal was to create ways the program could build upon our past accomplishments and make the biggest impact um, with our work. Uh, I'll share more about our progress that's gone on over the uh, past year in 2022 on various initiatives. But basically in 2021, the plan was put on paper, it was released, it has goals around it, and it's to make sure we've got a uh, basis around our grant making and being a leader among the civil justice community in North Carolina. We have a role in maximizing and increasing the funds that are available to support this type of work, communicating what we do, which is why we come and talk to you, and making sure that the critical work of legal aid goes out to the public uh, here in North Carolina. In 2021, we were able to um, rent out $4.8 million about three million of that actually came from uh, interest on lawyers trust account. The balance came from the money we had from Bank of America. All of that is gone. That was for foreclosure assistance. We do not have any more of that money. And we got a little bit of money that comes in associations on veteran work and domestic violence fees that we get that we administer out. So we're very, very proud of the impact that we've made. Over the past 39 years, we've given out more than $100 million in grants through the interest on lawyers' trust accounts, Cypre awards, and then, of course, funds like the Bank of America funding we were able to get. Lastly, um, in 2021, ULTA has continued to support conversations about unmet legal needs. And through the 2020 Legal Needs Assessment, we've continued to have conversations uh, in 2021 and use the data from that report to try to really make a difference. So in um, an update of 2022-2023, uh, um, the current year we've been really busy working towards our objectives that have been set out in our strategic plan, um, but we've just recently passed the deadline for our grant making for 2023. Uh, we've gotten 20, excuse me, 37 grant requests this year for more than $7.8 million. We will not have that much money to give out, but we believe we'll have more than we had in 2022, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. But we are really excited about the fact that we've had more grant applications. 
We think that is because we revamped um, our grant uh, making process. We've had more uh, contact directly with grantees. We've also talked more with you, and hopefully you've taken that back to your judicial districts, and that's why we've had more applicants this year to review. So the staff's working hard right now to put together all of the other information we'll need in December. The board will meet and we'll make our grant recommendations. And then in January, we'll be back here for your approval of what um, we see <coughs> appropriate to fund. Uh, we've continued our conversations um, about how to pursue, uh, how to um, make better our delivery system in North Carolina for civil legal aid. And so what we've done, based on the legal needs assessment, um, we put together four working groups um, to they were the four groups that were identified through that report needing the most concentration. The four areas that they've worked on are family law, legal services to immigrant populations, outreach and communications, which is how potential clients find out about their legal needs and the services that are available. And then lastly, coordinated intake, which I'm a big proponent of. But anyway, um, how potential clients get connected to civil um, legal aid programs. Um, I've been on a couple of panels nationally um, and talked and listened to Minnesota and Maryland, Washington, D.C., who have a coordinated intake for all legal services, all of the various providers across their state. There's one phone number to call. Wouldn't that be awesome? Anyway, lots of conversation to be had future on that, but we're helping to work for these conversations. Lastly, we've continued to work on our mission, which is to make sure we maximize the income um, from uh, the interest on the trust accounts. So the first half of 2022 was a little bit lower, as you might expect, but the second half has been higher. And we're really um, happy that the federal funds, um, the target rate um, has increased and um, many bank banks have increased their um, rates. And that's making a big difference. And hence, I'm hoping that we'll have $5 million to get out this year. I don't know that for sure, but we're very um, hopeful for that. Uh, I do want to take just a minute to recognize to you our prime partners. These prime partners give 75% of the federal funds target rates. Um, that's a higher level of support that comes in from the interest on our trust account. Those prime partners are listed up here. Uh, Bank of Oak Ridge, Blue Ridge Bank, Providence Bank and Trust, Roxborough Savings and Loan, U.S. Bank, and Wells Fargo. Really important, that makes a big difference on how um, the numbers go forward. So let me just tell you a few little stories. So 2021, that's the report I'm giving you today. So in 2021, so you know, where, where are we making an impact? Money granted to legal aid, Winston-Salem office, helping a victim of domestic violence, and that client being able to get um, their um, domestic violence order as needed. The Financial Protection Law Center, um, in uh, southeastern North Carolina, helping a family be able to keep their manufactured home and actually through a Chapter 13 plan be able to pay that home off. Um, in Lee Lake of North Carolina, helping a disabled um, citizen in northwestern North Carolina who was facing the termination of much needed personal care services, and this allowed this client to be able to remain in their home and have their services restored. Disability Rights of North Carolina in 2021, helping just one of many, but the seventh grade student with multiple disabilities and being able to make an impact with the IEP and have that child continue to be with their peers in school. And then finally, in 2021, talking about CARLA, where Pisco Legal Services um, assisted that legal guardian of their three grandchildren with a disabled husband get the stimulus checks that were needed and available to them and get an extra $13,000 to help take care of that family. So I've talked to you about 2021. I've talked to you about 2023. So what did we do in 2022? So this year, we gave out 18 grants, um, 18 different programs. So small up here, but um, I'm thinking these slides are going to be put back out into your portal and you can click on them and see. But this gives you some idea of what we funded. And so we gave out more than $4.2 million, and that was all from interest on lawyers' trust account. We also, in your report you'll come ne here next year, we did have some money from domestic violence fees and some money that was a veterans appropriation directly from the legislature, but those are much smaller this year. We don't have any Bank of America funds, but we're really proud that the interest on lawyers' trust accounts created this type of giving. We also were able last year 
put a little bit more money back in our reserves, so we feel like our reserves are fully funded. So that means this year's money ought to be able to be granted out um, in a greater fashion and hopefully provide more um, legal uh, services um, simply way uh, to the citizens of North Carolina. And the reason that it's so important that we're communicating this and taking a little bit more time in our reports to you, I know you want to go home on Friday, it's been a long week, I've been in your seat, so I know. Um, but it's because you're the ones who take this back and you tell the lawyers in your community, hey, your trust account made a difference. It's helping in our town. And what we hope with the new website that's getting to be in the works and things, we're going to be able to produce a map like you guys saw in July um, when you had a report about legal deserts where you could click on your community and see what was getting funded. We hope you're going to be able to do that in the next year or so. Um, once we can get the technology working properly to do that. But uh, again, it's really important that we understand this makes a difference. And not every lawyer knows that's what happens with their trust account money. But if you would tell them, it would make the biggest difference in the world because then they're more proud, right? And they're going to work harder and do more of what we do and know that we are doing our part for us to the legal aid in North Carolina. This is the way you can contact us if you need us. Um, we're here. And the Give the uh, report for the lawyers assistance program. I'm going to call upon Warren Savage. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I am not Robin Moranich, but I'm here on her behalf and I wanted to. Uh, uh, we just had our uh, annual report. She did a wonderful, she and her staff, Delia, uh, Susie, Nikki. Uh, Kathy and Candace have done a wonderful report for you. It's in your materials. I uh, commend it to your review, and it will explain some of the things that I will be telling you about today. I won't reiterate all of it. There's lots of charts and graphs. Um, but it, it is uh, 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 one of the things I hope that you take from that is this year, um, we continue, I think we've opened 130, 435 new files, which at this point uh, now we have about 750 open files going at a, at a time. They closed 30 files this year. But, uh, and out of that, uh, one of the things that is uh, continuing, and even more so now than ever before, is that the lawyers that are getting help through the uh, LAP program are not just substance abuse issues, but now is not uh, even more uh, psychological issues that are being uh, addressed uh, through that program. Uh, depression, anxiety, stress being the top three, but all, uh, a whole lot of other stuff going on that they're helping with. Um, you guys have been really important and uh, I think in if you look at the numbers, one of the trends that's been happening every year is that most of the folks that are coming to LAC now are self-referrals. Um, and like something like 64%, that's been inching up a couple of percentage points every year. Um, and uh, Rob and the staff feel very strongly that that is because of their efforts, our efforts as counselors, and uh, the volunteers' efforts. Uh, to really destigmatize the you know, yeah. sort of the idea that I need help <laughs> and uh, I need help and, and so the encouragement that you guys and, and uh, that they do in your local park community is so important towards that end. So I would uh, commend you to that uh, effort. Um, over the last 43 years, LAP has helped over 15% of lawyers in the bar. So that tells you how important it is significant that is, uh, uh, program that is, is probably the first, not probably. Can I extract that from the record? It is the best uh, lab program in the country, without a doubt. Um, so, uh, on, on to more lighter things, uh, uh, I ask you to check out and uh, subscribe to the uh, uh, their LinkedIn page and their uh, Twitter account. Uh, and they're getting to 10 or more uh, engagements a day on that. And people are finding, uh, finding their uh, services through that. Um, 
I commend once again the podcast. It's been with you for a third season. Uh, I, I was one of the guests, but uh, one on one of those uh, podcasts. But I will say that uh, uh, it, it, there's uh, most of the guests. It's about a little over half of the guests are actually volunteers, so they're uh, anonymous when they are on there. But they're telling their story and their engagement with. Lap and, and they're like, everyone is different and everyone's fascinating. Um, and then finally, I, I would uh, encourage you to uh, ask Lap to come to your districts. And uh, I know all of you have, they had over 60 uh, uh, different programs that they put on. I helped with a couple of them, but they, they are uh, doing programs either by the staff uh, or by uh, volunteers all over the state. So. Uh, and that's ticked up uh, since COVID. Now we're back up again to about pre COVID numbers. So thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Periodically, we have to take up uh, tenders of a, the surrender of a law license. Uh, and this morning, I'm going to recognize Deputy Council Tessa Hill with regards to the surrender of the law license of Megan Ashworth. This makes me feel a little short, this having to move the mic this far down. Um, good morning, officers and members of the council. You have in your materials the affidavit tendering the surrender of the law license of Megan Ashworth. Ms. Ashworth was licensed to practice law in North Carolina on September 16, 2016. Ms. Ashworth diverted $16,433.26 of legal fees that lawfully belonged to and should have been paid over to the law firm where she was employed. I've examined the affidavit and it comports with the requirements of the rules. Accordingly, I recommend that the North Carolina State Bar Council accept the resignation of Ms. Ashworth in order that she be disbarred and taxed with the costs. Do I have uh, a motion with regards to that? So moved. I have a second. second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you, Tessa. She signs it. Move into the committee reports. Um, I'm going to call upon Catherine Jean to give the report of the general counsel. And Catherine, if it doesn't cut into your time in your report, would you please uh, recognize the new office counsel? Yes, I would like to. I know it will cut into your time, so. <laughs> I'll try to be brief. <laughs> um, well, you just met Tessa Hale, um, and she's, this is, she's not brand new, but she hasn't been to a whole lot of council meetings. Um, we have three new deputy councils during just the last, since the last meeting. Um, let's see. I can't see that far. Yes, here's, this is Terry Nelson. Terry came to us from the district attorney's office in um, Wilmington. And before that, she worked with um, former state bar counselor Donna Rasco, um, who recommended her highly. And Donna was right; she's lovely. We're very happy to have her. Thank you. And let's see. And we have uh, Ryan Cook, and Ryan just was sworn in um, as a new member of the bar. Um, she was our summer intern two years ago, and our summer clerk this summer while she was studying for the bar exam. And um, so she's a brand new lawyer. We're very happy to have her. And then we also have Jessica Arnold, and Jessica um, came to us from uh, nine years, I guess, doing almost um, exclusively criminal defense um, in the state and federal courts. So she also has some background in wills and estates and some family law. I'm um, very happy to have her. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. And my report. You have in your materials a report of the activities of the Office of Counsel during the third quarter of 2022, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions you might have. 
Nobody ever asks me any questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> <coughs> All right, we're going to move into the uh, committee reports. We're going to start with the executive committee. Um, there are two sets of proposed minutes. Uh, well, there's proposed minutes of the council meeting of July 22nd, 2022, and also the minutes of the executive committee. Um, I don't guess we have to do that. Uh, yeah. Just the just council meetings. So, uh, the proposed minutes of the council meeting of July 22nd of 2022 are posted in SharePoint. I uh, hope you've had an opportunity to review those. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, adopt those uh, or accept those minutes? So moved with 15 seconds. Duly seconded. Uh, any questions about any of those or any revisions or amendments? <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Um, last, uh, <coughs> says President elect, I think it's now President Marcy Armstrong <coughs> to report on the finance audit. Good morning. It's heavy eyelids out there. Um, so the um, <coughs> Finance and Audit Committee um, reviewed the third quarter financial statements for the, the bar and the exec executive committee voted to uh, recommend approval of those financial statements um, to this council. And these were um, posted on SharePoint, so I'm sure you all know the deep dive into those. And if you have any questions, or ask me, ask Alice. Are there any questions? That comes as a recommendation from the finance report. Um, if there are no questions, uh, all in favor of uh, accepting the financial reports uh, that for the third quarter say aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> also, on the uh, motion of the Finance and Audit Committee, the um, Executive Committee voted to recommend that the dues uh, for 2023 um, remain at $300, which is the maximum allowed, allowed amount of this time. All right. Um, any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The Finance and Audit Committee also um, recommended to the Executive Committee um, approval of the um, Client Security Fund financial statements and budget, as well as, um, well, let's do that first. Okay. Um, financial statements and the budget for the Client <laughs> Security Fund has, uh, has been posted also in your SharePoint. Uh, does anybody have any questions about those? Not all in favor of what's accepting and adopting those say aye. Aye. All opposed. Thank you. So for 2022, the client security fund assessment imposed by the Supreme Court was $25 um, for each active member of the bar. And the, um, um, the recommendation is that there be zero assessment for 2023. And the reason for that is that the client security fund um, is required to maintain $1 million. And the amount now is at three point five million, and so there is at this point a need for the assessment. Although we did anticipate some claims coming down the road, so the reprieve may just be for a year, and that's the recommendation of the executive. Did you go back to your districts and say you cut their uh, their bar dues? So, um, but anyway, that's that's something. So you, um, anybody have any questions about that? Say it's 25 bucks, which you can't even get a hamburger in Charlotte for. <laughs> anyway, uh, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? We're Charlotte. <laughs> they deserve it. <laughs> also, um, posted on SharePoint was the uh, personnel policy that um, deals with the um, parental leave policy for the state guard. And I'm assuming all of you had a chance to look at that. The um, executive committee recommends adoption of the new personnel policy. Does anybody have any questions about that? I think that brings us in the line with some of the other agencies. I think Martha has done a really good job of researching that. So, um, if no questions, all in favor of adopting that, say aye. 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 All opposed. Uh, the next thing on our agenda is uh, the, or the executive committee was the meeting dates of the council in 2023. 
Uh, those are listed in your materials and include a uh, meeting January 17th through the 20th here at the State Bar <coughs> Building, April 18th to the 21st in the State Bar Building, July 18th through the 21st at the Renaissance Hotel in Asheville, and then October 24th through the 27th at the Bar Headquarters. Um, those are the proposed dates. They come as a recommendation from the Executive Committee. Does anybody have any questions with the parts of those? All in favor of setting those dates, say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you for your appointments. So the appointments advisory committee met and considered appointments for various boards, um, starting with the Board of Continuing Legal Education. There were three appointments to be made. Rebecca Eggers, Ryder, Elizabeth Heber, and Marissa Campbell were not eligible for reappointment, and the, um, the appointments committee recommended the executive committee. The executive committee recommends the appointment of the following to fill those vacancies Judge Addie Rawls, Robert Ponton, and Serena Williams. Comes as a recommendation from the appointments advisory committee. Does anybody have any questions about any of those? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Um, the recommendation is also um, for the chair of the Board of Continuing Legal Education, Adrian Walker, and the vice chair, Judge Ashley Parker Dunson. Anybody have any questions about those appointments? All in favor say aye. Uh, all opposed? Thank you. The Board of Law Examiners, there are five appointments to be made. Shelley Blake Curran, Judge Cherry, W. Elliott, Michael J. Green, and D. Clark Smith are all eligible for reappointment. Kimberly Herrick is not eligible for reappointment. Um, the, advis the advisory um, appointments advisory committee recommend <coughs> to the executive committee, which recommends to you, the reappointment of Ms. Curran, um, Ms. Elliott, Ms. Green, and Mr. Smith and for the appointment of Judge Athena Fox Brooks. Anybody have any questions with regards to that appointment? I don't know if we all uh, realize and understand that it's not all about grading for these folks. Um, they spend, I, I, I learned this because I wasn't appreciative of it, but um, when I went to the uh, their annual meeting um, at the Angus Barn to present uh, Ron Gittin, Baker is the Distinguished Service Award. Uh, they were telling me about the time commitment it takes to do the fitness and character hearings that they have to do. And it is an extraordinary lift that these folks do. And Lee, thank you for your, your board and all the work they do. So, um, all in favor of those appointments say aye. 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 All opposed, thank you. So, on the Board of Paralegal Certification, um, there were four appointments to be made. Warren Hodges, who's the paralegal educator, lawyer member, and Brian Scott, uh, as a lawyer member, are not eligible for reappointment. And then we also had to appoint a lawyer to complete the remainder of Matthew Smith's um, term. And we all know why that's happening. Um, and Yolanda Smith, the certified paralegal member, is also not eligible for reappointment. The advisory, um, Appointments Advisory Committee recommended to Executive Committee, which recommends to the Council the appointment of Precious, sorry, Vines Harris. Talk too much last night. Um, <clears throat> as the Lawyer Paralegal Studies Program Director, Carrie J. Marshall, the Paralegal Member, Scott Hart, the Counselor Member. And we'll note Scott's recommendation for this vote because you don't want to vote for yourself, right? So, um, anybody have any questions about that? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. <clears throat> so, although Brian Scott, um, his term expired, under some pending um, rule amendments, amendments, um, he would be allowed to serve another year as chair. And so, the recommendation is that Brian G. Scott uh, be appointed conditionally um, as the chair of the Board of Bureau Legal Certification pending approval of the amendments and that Benita Powell be um, appointed as the vice chair. Anybody have any questions about that? All in favor say aye. 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 
Flat Security Fund Board of Trustees have one appointment, um, which is a public member. Mr. John Burns is not eligible for reappointment, and the recommendation is Ted Whitehurst to fill his position as a public member. Anybody got any questions about that appointment? All, right. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? Also, the Client Security Fund, um, the current chair and vice chair are um, eligible for reappointment, and so the recommendation is the reappointment of Thomas Lunsworth II as chair and Amy Richardson as vice chair. Any questions about that? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? That is the report of the appointments advisory. Thank you. Thank you. All that hard work. Um, so we have uh, consideration of proposed amendments for adoption. These were published after the July meeting. Um, there has been no adverse comment with regards to these. I'm just going to go through them briefly. If you'd like to pull one of them for discussion, please let me know. I'll be happy to do that. Uh, there's a proposed amendment to the discipline and disability rules. There's a proposed another proposed amendment to the discipline and disability rules. There is a proposed amendment to the rules of administrative reinstatement. There's a proposed amendment to the trust accounting rules. There's a proposed amendment to technical. Uh, technical correction to the rules of professional conduct of 4.1 and then there is also a proposed amendment to the policies and rules concerning prepaid legal services plan. If anyone would like me to pull one of those for discussion. Uh, the executive committee has passed on those and is asking the, the council at this point in time to uh, uh, adopt to uh, publish those uh, rule amendments uh, there is no further comment or questions about any of them. I'll take them all in one group. Uh, all in favor to publish these rules and members, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? Published. Yeah. Also, we have proposed rule amendments. <laughs> um, that was for, yes, for, for adoption. For adoption, I'm sorry. That's, that's what, what Marcy was saying. <laughs> Well, it ain't the first time. Um, so let's go back. Those are all for adoption after they've been published. It was a late night last night. Um, those are for adoption. All in favor of adopting those rules so we can send them on to the Chief Justice. Uh, say aye. Aye. I'm all opposed. Thank you. The proposed amendments for publication are listed, and those can. Uh, I'll again take those in a group. Proposed amendments to the discipline and disciplinary rules during your materials if you have any questions about that. Proposed amendments to the rules governing the continuing legal education program. Uh, amendments to the rules on standing committees, which essentially creates the legal access committee. Uh, and amendments to the uh, rule governing IOLTA. Again, those are in your materials. Are there any questions? Does anyone like me to pull those for consideration of questions, further discussion? All right, so we'll take up all four of those at one time. All in favor of publishing these uh, amendments uh, so that we can get any comments back, uh, say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Great. Thank you, Marcy, for telling me what to do again. It says I'm Marcy. <laughs> she is. Uh, I'll recognize Todd Brown for the Issues Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the Issues Committee met and, and basically addressed three matters. The Issues Committee met and covered uh, basically three matters this week. Um, and give our report to the executive, executive committee. And I'll tell you briefly about those. We received a, an update on the continued work of our executive director to um, do the work that this body approved in July in terms of the, the DNI recommendations. The first was um, the ED continues to receive its bids from consultants or try to identify consultants to address 
proposals specifically to analyze the state bar's current policies, procedures, practices, and workforce, work environment, culture, and personnel to assess DNI enhancement opportunities, which is what we approved in July. Um, the, the executive director has received, as I recall, three, three uh, responses. She is analyzing those and will make a recommendation to um, the officers and if things are approved, we will um, bring it back to this body or proceed as the ED directs and um, we will proceed with that. Um, I think we have received three <coughs> so far. We, we asked for four. Uh, we received three and we will get those back to you in due course. Um, the other matter that we received <coughs> that we addressed on the DNI front addressed the uh, identification of an appropriate person to research, study, and prepare a report on the history of the state bar, which this body also approved back in July. And it, we're going to cover so many topics. There's going to be subcommittees galore. Uh, I have a funny feeling. Uh, but it's been touched on the problem that, it, that this committee is trying to address has been covered a couple times even today. Uh, Shelby mentioned it as part of our ULTA, uh, subchairing the Legal Deserts Committee, uh, which is um, a very, very big deal. And Brian's done some excellent work on how that is. We have to be cognizant, though, of what we as the State Bar can do and what we as the State Bar cannot do. Uh, we, cannot, um, we cannot change how lawyers get paid through the legislature on court appointed work, of course. Um, but we have to be very cognizant of who those other stakeholders are and reaching out to them. Um, we're also going to probably set up a subcommittee to do where are the funding sources. Uh, where can we find some sources to help fund things like legal debtors, stipends, and things like that. So we, we're, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. 
Uh, I even gave some of the members of the committee some homework. Um, so we'll look forward to grading those tests when they come back. Um, so we look forward to bringing you some action items, hopefully, in the very near future. So that is the report of the Access to Justice Committee. Mr. President uh, and Mr. Smith, uh, uh, my fifth rank, uh, just one minor correction. Uh, the wrongness of the state of the issues committee is being dissolved. It is not being dissolved. It will continue to work. Thank you. I thought you got rid of it because of it. I, I tried. I know you did. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, moving on to my very last and final report as grievance chair. Uh, first off, it has been my privilege and honor to chair that committee and some of the staff members. Um, they do really great work. I mean, from what you see, if you're on ethics or even what you see as a grievance member, um, you do not see probably one third of the work that they actually do. Uh, they spend a lot of time, they do put a lot of work, and they always are seeking the right answer. I will say that. We may not agree with them, but they are always seeking the right answer. So, members of council, the grievance committee met yesterday, and these are the numbers. 257 files were dismissed, two were continued, four were referred to TAC, five were, referred, five were given letters of warning, seven lawyers received admonitions, Five received reprimands. One lawyer received a censure. Eight lawyers were referred to disciplinary and hearing commission. And for those of you keeping score at home, that's 292 items. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, one thing, to, one thing just to add to what Todd said about the fact that the issues committee uh, is going to keep. I think if you remember, Todd mentioned that we're going to be in that issues committee looking at some additional opportunities to uh, defer discipline um, and like the trust accounting program that we have we're going to look to see if there's some other options out there for us to consider so um, Rich if you will come up and give the administrative report <coughs> Morning. Morning. Good morning, folks. It's good to see everybody this morning. The uh, administrative committee met on Wednesday and we um, voted to uh, recommend the council take the following actions uh, to uh, transfer 98 lawyers to an active status, three upon fulfilling uh, certain conditions by the January meeting. Uh, we also voted to approve non pro tonk status for one lawyer for December 31st of last year. Uh, we voted to uh, grant reinstatement to 58 lawyers from the active status. Uh, seven petitions were approved to reinstate lawyers from suspended status. Uh, two petitions were deferred to the January 2023 meeting. We granted uh, out-of-state attorneys a pro bono practice status, and we voted to issue suspension orders to 32 members uh, for non-compliance with uh, CLE requirements. It's good to see everybody. I've really enjoyed this year. It's good to see everybody in person as opposed to uh, being on Zoom screens. That, that is the report of the administrator. All right, we need a, a motion to adopt that report uh, because there are some notices show calls and things of that sort do i have a motion to adopt that so moved uh yeah, second second any questions of rich about the administrative report all in favor say aye aye all opposed all right thank you rich for your work this year andre andre is going to give the report of the unit authorized practice committee morning um, so the authorized practice committee met on Wednesday and the minutes are in your council materials uh, we had eight prepaid plans that were registered this month magic number for action taken is nine eight letters of caution one dismissal and then uh, we have one action item for today I believe uh, we've got a uh, subcommittee that met and is making a recommendation for the prepaid uh, legal services 
initial and annual fee for registration to be increased from $100 to $300. So I am making a motion for council to accept that recommendation from the subcommittee. Thank you. Um, so that the, uh, the action item, it deals with the policy of the authorized practice committee. Um, does anybody have any questions of Andrea about that? All right. If not, uh, do I have a motion with regards to that? Second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. If you haven't found out, this is so cool. This is why coming back in person is so neat you get to talk to the counselors. Uh, Andrea's daughter is going to be a hurricane chaser. You all need to talk to her about that. So, <laughs> I mean, I always say that I'm, I'm proud of her and scared to death too. <laughs> so you have a chat with her about it. I mean, this is pretty cool. Congratulations. Um, Uh, Dorothy Harrison Mitchell, Judge Mitchell, Harrison Mitchell Communications Club. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as always, it is such a blessing to be alive, first of all, and to be here with you all. I am too excited that we get to be in person and get to get some hugs and some handshakes and all of that good stuff. I will start off as I always do and let everyone know that we are continuing to live stream as we are doing right now. Um, that has been a, a great asset for us um, throughout these meetings. We're continuing to do that. We uh, These meetings, as well as other meetings, um, you have in your materials, our SharePoint materials, of the various videos and views and how many subscribers we have. Um, so that is in your materials. I won't go to that. I know I usually elicit shouts and all of that good stuff, but I won't do that today. Um, we are also continuing our podcast and those are going really, really strong. We always ask that if you have any ideas of some podcast topics that we could produce, please let us know that. We have a big one coming up with three judges, retired Chief Judge Linda McGee, Justice Robin Hudson, and Judge Lillian Jordan. That will be coming up soon, so be on the lookout for that. We are also work have a new message map working group that was formed to work on our different messaging. And so that is whether it's a two minute elevator speech, speech or a 20 minute pitch. I was about to put speech and pitch together. I made up a new word. Um, <laughs> but, and that's for whether it's the general public that is our audience or other lawyers. And so we have a group working on that. That's gonna be excited about that so that we can have our messaging be the same throughout all of our different um, programs and the various folks that is giving it, those messages out. We also have, um, we are working on a new agenda and meetings, materials, program, and portal. Um, as you know, we work through SharePoint in order to get our materials to everyone, but we have another program that we are looking to utilize moving forward, and we think that will be a little bit easier to navigate, and so be on the lookout for that. Um, I'm also excited that I think that program um, we've heard from staff that that program will be much easier for our staff and kind of put minutes in and work on it and um, live time and all of that good stuff. And so we're excited about that. And so that is my report from the communications committee. Um, we did meet on this past Wednesday. Um, I want to make sure everyone knows we did meet, even though it was really quick. We did have our meeting. Um, and so I don't have any action items. Thank you. All right. Anybody have any questions? All right. <coughs> Mr. Rawls. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Past President. Report of the Ethics Committee. Good morning, everybody. I want to echo what Matt said about uh, the incredible staff that we're all blessed with here. And I'll go over that in a minute. But uh, I want to start with uh, Ann Parkin, who does our random audits. She is on the road constantly and busy. I mean, and she does such an incredible job. Um, and uh, she has a report from her latest quarterly random audits. And um, every quarter, 
it looks like we have recurring non-compliance issues, some more serious than others. But this last report from Ann Parkin, she referred four lawyers and law firms to grievance. And I, I have not seen that in my seven years on the Ethics Committee. And um, so I would uh, commend uh, all of us going back to our districts and, and emphasizing some of the technical violations and minor violations and some of the more serious violations that keep recurring quarter after quarter. Uh, but Ann Parkin does a fantastic job and, and like I say, she is on the road uh, constantly. Uh, Nicole and Suzanne uh, field hot grounders like Jared Dieter, Dieter at short stock last quarter. They fielded over a thousand communications, phone calls, and emails with ethical questions from, uh, from lawyers. And that's a significant number when you think about it. We've got 30,000 lawyers in the state. A thousand of them called in with ethical questions, and that's a significant number percentage of lawyers. And that's one of the most valuable things that the state bar does. Um, likewise, the, the staff, Brian included, uh, gave eight uh, CLE presentations during this past quarter. Once again, trying to educate and keep current uh, North Carolina lawyers. So, you know, to Ryan, Nicole, Suzanne, and Ann Park, and, and especially and finally, and most importantly to me, is Lenise Heidring, who's in the back. Lenise is the one that, <laughs> that holds us all together. Is amazing. She is just amazing. So thank you, Lenise, for what you've done. So uh, we had a, a, a good meeting yesterday, uh, a lot of lively discussions and a lot of rabbit holes, as uh, Mac McCarley would say, that we went down. Uh, but we had, um, we had four items that were sent or returned to subcommittee. And I want to talk about two of them just briefly because they're really sort of in the front windshield of, of all of us. And, and the first one is the subcommittee on billing of overlapping legal services. That is, the, the simple question that was first sent to us, can a lawyer fly on an airplane for four hours, bill for four hours of travel, and then bill another four hours for the work he does on the airplane? You would think that was a pretty simple question. But all of a sudden, you know, with all of the different various billing practices that lawyers engage in now, from flat fees, hybrid fees, unit fees, that, you know, this has turned into a somewhat complicated matter. And we've had some, we've had some input, uh, informal input from some of the larger law firm lawyers, and uh, we'll be listening to them uh, very closely. The other uh, that's of interest is the uh, sale of a law practice and the proper handling of cases, transfer cases. As, as the older generation um, uh, sort of moves out of the way, and we want to make sure that lawyers are uh, compliant with the rules of professional conduct as they transition. Uh, by the way, Davis Poisson, if anybody wants to talk, chew his ear off about overlapping billing services, uh, he's, he's the guy. We do have one, one uh, subcommittee that's looking at a rule amendment to Rule 1.8e, which uh, is going to look at the uh, possibility of uh, nonprofit clinics and law schools working pro bono with indigent clients to be able to gift funds for essential purposes during their representation. And the ABA changed that rules a couple of years ago, and we've had an inquiry from Campbell Law School, among others. And so this is going to be a very interesting uh, issue uh, that, that I think, I hope moves quickly uh, through it. Um, we have uh, one motion for uh, a, a, an 
FEO to be adopted, and that is proposed 2022 FEO 5, which is client paying public adjusted witness funds to on a contingency fee. That is statutorily authorized. That is in your materials. Um, so we would make a motion that that formal ethics opinion be adopted. Right. Does anybody have any questions about that formal ethics opinion? We have a motion to adopt uh, 22 FEO 5. Motion so moved. Second. A second. Don't second. hesitate. Let's, let's <laughs> pull it out. Uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. The other uh, rule amendments that we passed at ethics were considered by the executive committee and those were rule 1.15 safekeeping of property and rule 4.1 truthfulness and statements those were uh, presented by the executive committee and passed earlier so that is the report of the ethics committee and i want to thank everybody that was on the committee uh, this year i've enjoyed serving as chair it's been a, it's been a privilege thank, thank you Evan. thank you mike or, or while Mike is coming up here, I want to, I, I sat in for on the LAMP committee, which is not a committee that a lot of us uh, have an opportunity to do it because for one thing, it's at the end of the executive committee and we're all trying to get back to the hotel. Um, but they do some incredible work. I was really impressed. I wanted to stop by to thank them. Your, your committee uh, is, um, I guess, not seen, the work is not seen by the rest of us. I know the military personnel are grateful. Like I said, it's all the leadership. <laughs> it starts from here because I appointed you. So. Did I hear you say that Andrea's daughter could be a hurricane chaser? Yeah. Andrea, you, she doesn't need to chase them. It's parked in my driveway. There'll be one coming along about every two or three months. I've had five hurricane eyes pass over my house since I've lived there. That's just the eye. Uh, you know, one of the, I've been uh, on, the, on the council now for six years, and I, one of the things I've always wondered about is just what is the standard of dress for us while we're at a council meeting? I mean, is it, do we wear a suit? Do we wear blue jeans? I thought this would go formal today. I got black blue jeans on. <laughs> but, the, but the answer was issued in July when we were at the ballast down in, in uh, Wilmington. And I saw Alice, Alex nicely in the lobby with swim trunk trunks and no t-shirt. No standards. <laughs> Absolutely no standards. That was, that was frightening. You're all wrong, All right, we met yesterday, uh, land committee, that's the lawyer's assistance for military personnel. And to confirm that our much anticipated CLE on October 28th is going off. And it is at the, at the law school of Carolina. The uh, uh, agenda is uh, including military uh, legal assistance programs, emerging, emerging issues and trends, military disability benefits, and then how to lose those military disability, uh, disability benefits when you get divorced, that's in the family law, state planning, consumer law, in military legal and military legal assistance, mental health counseling, and client counseling. So we're really uh, glad to get that off. It's been three years uh, in the making because of COVID. There are also some other CLEs we got going on uh, in conjunction with ABA LAMP. That's on Tuesday, October 25th. That's housing rights for military families and veterans. November 9th, professional responsibility focusing on military and veteran clients. And then on the 19th at the Bar Center, we've got a, there's another CLA, CLE uh, dealing with a number of uh, veterans issues. And the reason this is so important in this area, particularly because North Carolina is home to so many active and retired military personnel in this area of the law is, is pretty esoteric, so it's important for us to get this uh, stuff out so that uh, the consumers can use it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for your work. Thank you again, Mr. President. Uh, before I start uh, to report on the feel-good committee of the uh, entire 
bar. Uh, I wanted to, number one, thank the folks up here, uh, Darren, Marcy, and Barbara, uh, and Todd all. We have, as I've told you, we've had a backlog of folks that have been award, well, awarded the uh, Distinguished Service Award, but haven't received it in a nice ceremony uh, because of COVID. And boy, that backlog broke uh, over the, the summer and in the past quarter. Uh, and we've had, uh, and these folks have been going all over the place getting free meals and uh, and, uh, and but handing out nice awards uh, to folks. Uh, I can tell you, uh, we had a, a, an incredible uh, celebration in Durham that Dorothy and Barbara were there to present to Mickey the show. That was just crazy. We had a surprise visit for Martin Luther King. Um, and uh, anybody who was there will know that joke. Uh, the uh, Ron Baker was presented um, the, the, uh, by Darren, I believe, at the Angus Barn. But the nice thing about that was uh, Ron's long uh, service to the law examiners, uh, and he wanted to be recognized in front of that group. So they had it. So I guess it was a pretty small, nice. Presentation, but uh, uh, lobster and steak too. Right? Lobster and steak, so, that, so that's awesome. So that's you know that's one of the things that's nice about this award that the recipients can uh, be awarded in front of the the groups that they really want to be. And then we had a really nice one for Shelby down in uh, uh, Shelby Benton down in uh, Goldsboro uh, that uh, Barbara was there and uh, Hattie Bloom uh, did the presentation. Marcy. Uh, had been uh, wanting to do, to do it. She had something come up, and uh, anyway, uh, and Heidi jumped in, and it was a, a very nice, nice uh, program down there. Upcoming programs that I urge you to, uh, if you can, and you oh, there's Shelby right there. That was great, wasn't it? Um, so, uh, upcoming programs that uh, we'll, we'll have in presentations. Uh, Jimmy Narens uh, down in Smithfield's coming up in a few weeks, or. Marcy's going to be there uh, uh, presenting that, and uh, uh, I urge you to do that. I I'll, I'll, might try to be there. I love know Jimmy forever. Uh, Charles Hardy, everybody knows Charles Hardy, my predecessor in this position, um, and he's uh, being presented at the Pitt County uh, Christmas party in, uh, on the 8th. I think Darren's going to be doing that. And then Mike McIntyre, who uh, uh, he was presented got the award before uh, COVID even happened. He's wanted to have it done at the, uh, what's the dinner called? Yes. The Buck Harris dinner. And of course, uh, they hadn't had a Buck Harris dinner for now almost three years. Uh, so we're finally getting that award done. Um, I'd also like to thank Suzanne, uh, who's our staff member who does everything and, and garners all these nominations together. It's awesome. I want to thank John Willardson. He's been my right-hand man, vice chair. And as he's leaving the council, I really appreciate uh, that. And with that all said, uh, at this time, Mr. President, I'd like to move to go into closed session uh, under General Statute 143-318.11, subpart A, subpart of that, two, to prevent the premature disclosure of an honorary degree, scholarship, prize, or similar award. All right, I just tell everybody who's leaving, just hang tight because we're gonna be coming back in I have the changing of the gavel, so we'll open the doors at the appropriate time. Somebody needs to move to <laughs> All right. We have a motion. Do we have a motion? Uh, we have a motion. Do I have a second to second. close second. session? Second. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Gracious. Cool Sorry. All right. Um, so you want to give us the report and make your uh, recommendation? 
Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Darren. So I'd like to my, uh, move at this time with the approval of the executive committee yesterday that the council approve the nominations of the two lawyers we discussed in closed session, candidate A and candidate B, for presentation of the John B. McMillan Distinguished Service Award standard, uh, subject to our standard due diligence checks. Any uh, questions or comments we did in closed session? All in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed? All right. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much. I know that there are two or three of you that are working on other nominations right now. I urge you to get them in. Um, get in the nominations. We can help you sometimes with the uh, support letters by uh, reaching out to folks too. Um, so uh, don't hesitate to get those things going. Thank you very much. All right, that brings us to the conclusion of our reports. I want to once again thank everyone for all the hard work you've done over the course of the last year in allowing me to preside as your president. Uh, I think we're in good hands as you see the, uh, the group that uh, is coming in to, to share our leadership. I look forward to working with Marcel and Matt and Todd. Um, and I will invite Immediate past president um, in. Uh, May I say something before I step down? I have sat here and listened to all this praise of the staff during this meeting, and I have to say there are exceptions to every rule. And I'm just going <laughs> to take a moment to lodge a formal complaint <laughs> against Peter Bolak, Ryan <laughs> 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 who called me and said, take part in Darren's tribute. You only have one line. <laughs> we won the Viking game. That's it. <laughs> so be very careful. Barbara's worried because there has been some comments about sending that to her church where she plays the piano. <laughs> um, and, and then we're going to have a, a, a special service of prayer for <laughs> All right, if you'll go and escort the new vice president to the chair. Get the hot seat. Oh, yeah. I'm following you. I'm glad we decided not to. John Silverstein. Oh, and chest bumped me when we arrested <laughs> him. The man said he wasn't going to try to do that. <laughs> Let's give Barbara a round of applause. says I'm bossy. I'm still going to. Well, she is. <laughs> I'm still going to leave this tribute to our outgoing president Darren Jordan, who is he's phenomenal. I mean, you all know that. I don't have to tell you that. You've um, you've seen him in action. Um, he's a great guy, and so we I would like to honor him. And there's a resolution and appreciation for Darren. Whereas Darren D. Jordan was elected by his fellow lawyers from Judicial District 19C, now 27, in 2010 to serve as their representative in this body, he was thereafter re-elected counselor for two successive three-year terms. And whereas in October 2019, Mr. Jordan was elected vice president, and in October 2020, he was elected president-elect, and on October 7, 2021, he was sworn in as president of the North Carolina State Bar. And whereas during his tenure with the North Carolina State Bar, Mr. Jordan served on the following committees and boards. Ad hoc committee to study changes to disciplinary rules, including his chair. Administrative committee, appointments advisory committee, including as vice chair and chair. Communications committee, including as chair. 
Ethics Committee, including Vice Chair and Chair. Executive Committee, including Vice Chair and Chair. Finance and Audit Committee, including as Vice Chair and Chair. Grievance Committee, Issues Committee, including Vice Chair and Chair. Legislative Committee, Publications Committee, and the Lawyers Assistance Program Board, including as Chair. And whereas, while serving as a State Bar Counselor, Mr. Jordan participated in numerous significant initiatives of the State Bar, including two substantial revisions to the North Carolina Rules of Professional Conduct, construction of the new State Bar Headquarters, the successful adjudication of a major lawsuit against the State Bar, and an extensive review of the disciplinary process to name but a few. And whereas President Jordan's tenure as an officer of the State Bar began just prior to the global pandemic that necessitated the conversion of five consecutive quarterly meetings of the State Bar Council from April 2020 through April 21 to online Zoom events, a format that was an impediment to the look you in the eye, shake your hand discussion and camaraderie of face-to-face -face meetings that are dear to President Jordan's professional heart. Nevertheless, President Jordan rose to every occasion by facilitating or presiding over efficient, organized, and to the greatest extent possible, inclusive meetings, whether online or in person. And whereas President Jordan built upon the undertakings of his predecessor, including the completion of the following initiatives, the exploration of ways to improve diversity, inclusion, and equity in the profession and in the agency, studies of the intersection of lawyer competency and the court secure leave policy, and with the caseload and compensation of court-appointed defense attorneys and the study of regulatory changes that have the potential to improve access to justice for those who are fin financially unable to afford legal representation, which study will help to inform the work of the Access to Justice Committee and New Standing Committee instituted under President Jordan's leadership. And whereas President Jordan's commitment to volunteer public service and to the Sixth Amendment and to the right to counsel for those charged with crimes or who faced significant deprivations of liberty was demonstrated by his service from 2014 to October 2021 on the Indigent Defense Services Commission while also serving as a State Bar Counselor and Officer as Chair of the Commission. <clears throat> President Jordan was and continues to be a tremendous advocate for lawyers who handle indigent defense and for their clients. <clears throat> and whereas President Jordan's service on the Lawyers Assistance Program Board evolved into a commitment to promote the importance of lawyer well-being, devoted two of his president's messages in the State Bar Journal to mental health issues, and ending one of those messages with the following admonishment. Don't reach out only to the attorney who seems to be having a bad day. Reach out to the attorney who may be fighting a battle that is invisible. And whereas, throughout his service as a State Bar officer, President Jordan has embodied, nurtured, and advocated for the fostering of the collegiality that underpins our profession, traveling across North Carolina to act as an ambassador for the State Bar at an untold number of professional conferences, meeting with everyone from superior court judges to court reporters. He also traveled untold miles to present the John D. McMillan Distinguished Service Award, including arranging for an in-person presentation of the award to a recipient who initially received her award on an online presentation. Entirely on his own initiative, he hosted informal dinners throughout the state in which lawyers in different, pra different practice areas could socialize an atmosphere of support and friendship. And whenever there was an opportunity to extend the hand of professional kindness, despite any personal inconvenience due to travel or schedule, President Jordan did so, as demonstrated by his trip to a rural county to present a certificate of service to a 50-year lawyer diagnosed with terminal cancer who would not live to attend the 2022 50-year lawyer luncheon. And whereas, when he first became an officer, President Jordan treated some members of the State Bar staff to a delightful day in his hometown of Salisbury, where they dined in a favorite local cafe, strolled the beautiful downtown, and enjoyed a gift of cheer wine fudge from the local candy emporium, thereby forecasting the warm and generous relationships President Jordan would cultivate with the State Bar staff throughout his tenure as an officer. And whereas, whether it was a Hurricanes playoff game or possibility that the fishing would be good at his mountain sanctuary that weekend, President Jordan always made sure that the Friday Council meeting ended on time. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore, be it resolved that the 
Council of the North Carolina State Bar does hereby and with deep appreciation expressed to Darren D. Jordan his debt for his personal service to the State Bar, to the people of North Carolina, and to the legal profession, and for his dedication to the principles of leadership, integrity, professionalism, and equality. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be made a part of the minutes of the annual meeting of the North Carolina State Bar, and that the original of this resolution be delivered to Darren B. Jordan. such a long list of accomplishments, but it took like an hour to read it. So, um, I just before we adjourn, we're getting ready to do that because I know everybody's ready to go. Um, I just want to say one more shout out to Caroline. Um, I know I did last night for her help with the dinner, but I, she also had the 50 year lawyer's luncheon, the council dinner. <coughs> Caroline, you're amazing, and I and I appreciate you. And I know I threw you a lot of curveballs for last night, and you just you were amazing. You did a great job, and we we're very lucky. To have you. business is um, I've requested from you guys um, if you have any specific requests for appointments and where you would like to serve I'm really trying to please everybody I've heard from a lot of you um, if you told me something um, in person you need to email to me because my brain was overloaded so I, 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 I don't sure I'll remember so make sure you send me an email any of you have already done that if you haven't please do that within like the next two weeks um, because um, we're going to start working on those committee assignments and I do appreciate it Appreciate all of you. I'm going to need your help. As I said, strong leaders surround themselves with people that are a lot smarter than they are. You're a whole lot smarter than I am, and you're going to make me look good next year, aren't you? So I'll be calling on you. And I believe that. Do we need a motion to adjourn? Is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Second? Second. All right. Let's go. Safe travels. Safe travels, everybody.